Why is a given species found in one place, but not in another? Another way to ask that is what is limiting uh, the distributions of species? Okay. On this plot here, we've got Ligodium japonicum, and it's this fern. Okay. And as you may guess, japonicum means it comes from East Asia originally but here's where it is in the United States now okay so we've got a it's county by county map and so we've got a couple of the islands in Hawaii have it all over Louisiana Florida southern Georgia Alabama and Mississippi okay. um, there appears to be some up here in Pennsylvania why isn't it all over the place what limits the distribution of this species? Why didn't it start out here in the US? Well, this all comes down to a couple different things. Environment, so climate, and dispersal, okay? So here we're saying that this stuff is allowed to grow there by the environment. It's got suitable habitat, it's got a niche it can fill, the climate is amenable to it growing and reproducing. Up here, maybe not so much. Okay, so in that sense, the climate and the environmental variables are limiting what can live there. It's called environmental filtering. Right? In another sense, it's got to be able to get there first. Okay, here's another example of climate limiting skylark distribution. <clears throat> so here we've got skylark distribution in red. Okay, And here we've got an environmental variable. The mean maximum temperature in January average. Okay, So we're looking at the warmest that it gets in January on average over a decadal scale. Okay, And we see that this actually maps quite nicely with Skylark distribution. So this is one way that we can study this sort of thing, is look for environmental variables that correlate with known species distributions. Okay. So factors that influence species distributions, dispersal adaptations and barriers, can it get there in the first place? niche availability, is there somewhere for it to live, suitable environment, suitable food, suitable soil pH, suitable salinity. Humans play a big role in where species are, and climate plays a massive role. Kind of this goes into niche availability. Okay. Humans very often go into dispersal adaptations and barriers. Okay. So for instance, this is the reproductive unit of a fern. It's microscopic. It's a little spore. You can blow it on the breeze. This is the reproductive unit of an elephant. Despite Dumbo, they do not fly. Okay, so I would expect that the fern has a bigger dispersal advantage than an elephant. Okay, it can make it out to islands just by blowing on the breeze. Okay, elephants would have to swim out there or cross on a land bridge or something like that. So. These are barriers to dispersal, okay? And then niche availability. Once you get there, this fern spore lands somewhere like this, this nice, lovely looking desert patch. What happens? It dies. All right, so in this case, it was able to get there, but it did not have uh, an environment that was suitable to, for living, and so it, ferns don't live there. Elephants don't live here because of two reasons. They can't get there, and if they did get there, they would die. Okay. We could take an elephant, put it on a big transport airplane, dump it off in the middle of this badlands, and then we could just watch it die, just like the fern. Okay. This is Antarctica, right here, in one of the dry valleys, and scientists there have to be really careful because it's a long-term ecological research uh, site, the Taylor Valley. 
so they walk in certain paths so they're kind of not disturbing the, the delicate rocky soil. All right. What's really interesting is that when you sequence the DNA in the path that our scientists walk and you go two meters away and sequence the DNA, it's different bacteria that are found there. Two meters away. What's the difference? Well, scientists are walking there. It changes the environment a little bit. Different bacteria can grow there, but how do those bacteria actually get to Antarctica in the first place? Well, there's some potential for long-range dispersal, but if you're up in the air that long, UV from the sun can typically kill you off. It was coming in on their boots, and so the researchers who were doing that study started swabbing scientists' boots and found the same bacteria that was growing on the path there. So humans can take stuff around. Bacteria that have never been in Antarctica are there now. All right, just looking at big climate variables, remember temperature, precipitation. These are richness and abundance of types of slime molds. Okay, so this was a study across um, New Zealand, which has a pretty big um, range from the equator down towards the southern hemisphere, or deeper into the southern hemisphere. Okay, so as we go right on the x-axis, that's distance from equator. Okay, so we're moving away from the equator there. Here we're moving up in elevation as we go right, and here we're moving up in rainfall as we go right. And you can see the trends here. The abundance of slime molds dives as you move away from the equator to colder climate. Okay. As you go up in elevation, it's the same story. And here, this is kind of surprising, but as you go down or up in rainfall, you start losing some of those slime molds. So this is nice trend in richness and abundance showing how things like temperature and rainfall can influence species distributions.